Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 375, which means for 375 times I've said welcome to Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's March 1st, 2018. George, it's spring. Let's do a quick weather update. We've had four days of beautiful 50 degree Fahrenheit weather here, and we're going to follow that up tomorrow with a nor'easter, which is where the, the rain, thank God, not snow, is going to swirl off the coast and blow 60 mile an hour, 60 mile per hour winds right here in the great state of Connecticut. I'm assuming it's pollen season down there. Oh, Kevin, it's beautiful. Low 80s, low humidity, but yellow dust every morning when you go outside. The flowers are in bloom, the birds are tweeting, uh, the bees are buzzing. It's a wonderful place to be. Yeah, zippity doo da. Now, I saw a nose come up. Is there a dog in your lap? Or did you put him yes, down? Yes, I have the dog with me. He's sitting in my lap because if, if I put him on the floor, he thinks I'm talking to him. Uh-huh. And he needs to respond to each of my ejaculatory points. That's right. But if I put him in my lap and rub his chest and stomach, he's very quiet. You can show him to us. I'm sure people, the audience would love Oh, look Yes, at look, there he is. <laughs> now that we're completely off topic, you know, it's like a it's like a frivolous Friday, but it's not. Okay, George, I woke up one day, and I learned some news from Canada. They have a druid in the church up there, and I said, oh, we got to talk about this, because pagans and druids show up uh, on the coast of Europe, here in Canada. We had a couple in the Episcopal Church, but they kicked them out. Um, what's the background here to the story? Well, the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, did a sort of magazine show, half-hour discussion interview with Sean, uh, Sanford Beck, a Anglican Church of Canada priest in Saskatoon, mm-hmm. which is way up there. I don't even know how far north that is. Well, Father Beck uh, shared how he is called as a priest of the, Epis- of the Anglican Church and also called as a pagan or druid priest Mm -hmm. the spirits of nature wind and water shamanism oh this is this is the good old days kevin i miss this sort of stuff (laughs) this is the fun stuff now i remember i think there's three different incidents uh some under catherine jeffert shorey where they just put their foot down they're not going to have one was a a practicing muslim and christian out one was a pagan out one was a witch out the, you know they, they have some standards in the Episcopal Church but I don't see that reflected in in Canada at all well this is an old old story and not for those with memories in 1997 at the General Convention of the Episcopal Church That's in Philadelphia right. the first one I attended Trinity Wall Street distributed free to every member of the convention uh, a magazine they called Health and Religion or Health and Faith or something like that. And there was an article by an Episcopal priest who discussed his raccoon spirit guide. How the raccoon would lead him into the depths of consciousness. And I think this guy started an LSD trip sometime in the late 1960s and it was still going in 1997. Well, Frank Griswold, presiding bishop at the time, disavowed this. And every so often we get these kooks popping up. Even Charles Benison, Charles Benison Jr., (laughs) had a pagan priest in the Philadelphia suburbs, and he canned the guy. Now, if Charles Benison is going to can somebody... You better believe that's a line they're not going to cross. But the Anglican Church of Canada, I've written to Bishop Irving of Saskatoon. Saskatoon. No comment. (laughs) Nothing, huh? Now, they might be doing a neurological workup on this guy to see if he's a crackpot. No, he's a crackpot. (laughs) But the guy... guy... Whoa. Would you hang up on me? Calling George Bay. Call you. (laughs) Let's just see if George stepped on the cord. Hello, are you there? Hello, George. (laughs) Julius hit the keyboard (laughs) twice and logged me out. You couldn't play with the dog? (laughs) What? 
<laughs> Don't blame the dog. <laughs> no, I mean, he was trying to get me to itch this one corner of his ear. Now he's licking the keyboard. I must have Tell had some chocolate or something. <laughs> Uh, we have to have a new policy. No dogs in the lap while recording. But uh, for today, let's continue on. So they have a quack up there. Now, this is the province that canned and uh, um, threw out J.R. Packard. Yes, it is. It, it sort of tells you something about the Anglican Church of Canada. Mm -hmm. The only thing that can get you in trouble is creedal Christianity. You can be... Uh, you can go totally bananas. You can violate every single canon on marriage and ethics and all this stuff. You can have your sex change. You can marry multiple partners. You can do any of this stuff. You can even worship Odin or, or <laughs> Thor or the spirit of wind and water and burn sage and all this stuff as you're doing it and go, whoa, 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 whoa. But if you believe in the in the Apostles of Nicene Creeds, you're in trouble, pal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, can it? You know, the thing the Anglican Church of Canada has not published its statistics for almost twenty years, and every so often we'll get little glimpses of them when somebody makes a speech uh, who knows the numbers. But man, this church is in such fast freefall. It's my belief that the Anglican Church of North America is now larger than the oh, Anglican Church think, of Canada. Yeah. If they ever put the numbers together, I think you'd see it's, uh, you know, ACNA is at least uh, twenty percent larger at this point. It's been a crash, uh, and I, not and not every Anglican Canadian is a kook because they've got some good dioceses like mm -hmm. the Arctic and some of the other places, and plus the in places like Toronto, there's some good individual parishes. But as a national institution, the ACA is oh, it's gone. It's, uh, they should all be druids up there. Uh, moving on, uh, we but also they wouldn't have a pension, Kevin. Hence, why we have yes. Druid Anglicans, because then they can, you know, worship, worship uh, raccoons, but also have a pension when they retire. That's, that's cool. Uh, sad news. Uh, you and I have talked about China uh, frequently in the program. Uh, it comes up. We talk about uh, hypercapitalism in China. We talk about uh, the underground church in China. Uh, what's with the dog? <laughs> the dog doesn't like the green screen. <laughs> the dog feels that it is impinging upon his natural rights to have unfettered access to me at all times and okay. all places. Um, Julius, come here. Julius, good boy. Back in my lap. Okay, lift him by his collar. There we go. <laughs> And we've talked about uh, uh, the underground church in China, and recently talked about how China convinced the Roman Catholic Church to replace their bishops with Chinese bishops of Chinese origin, uh, Chinese uh, political origin. And you and I know about the uh, Archbishop of Hong Kong and his work within uh, the Chinese church there. And I said, when I saw this article, Chinese kill a lawyer, uh, a Christian lawyer, it, we need to talk about it. This is going to be a little bit more serious than the first topic uh, because China of old is Marxist and had no trouble killing millions of people uh, to uh, implement their ideology. Are we going to see a repeat of that? Uh, a lot of people forget how violent China was. And it's time to return to that topic. Uh, Christians aren't going to fare well in modern day or old China, George. Well, Mao actually killed more people than Stalin or Hitler mm -hmm. did. Uh, so Mao still holds the record of deaths uh, due to his political dreams and ambitions. What's going on in China? The uh, Communist Party is cracking down on religion because Christianity is going so rapidly. There are estimates that up to 22% of the Chinese population is now Christian. And this growth is occurring in young people, people under the age of 30 and under 40. And this poses a threat to the Chinese Communist Party. So they have been gun cracking down on Christianity. There have been multiple stories. We've run some of the Chinese pulling down churches, destroying public uh, statements of professions of Christianity. And you know, in other words, a church can't have a cross or a steeple. Some provinces of China have outlawed churches from allowing children inside. People under 21 may not worship in a Chinese church uh, because the police are watching. 
The Chinese government recently ordered that cameras be installed, video, closed circuit video cameras be installed in all these churches. Why? Well, the Chinese government says for protection. What's the reality? So they know exactly who's there and who's not. That's right. Latest story, a Chinese Christian lawyer, a man was in the United States recently, went to the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington. Uh, he's had a career of defending Christian pastors and activists arrested by the police. He goes into a hospital for a very minor procedure, and the government announces, oh, he died. Isn't that just a shame? How did he die? Well, he bled to death. Hmm. You know, how, it, so the Bob Fu, who wrote an article we published on Anglican Inc. from China Aid, has accused the Chinese government of murder. And other Chinese activists have made this point as well, that China is liquidating Christian activists through auto accidents, through unexpected deaths in hospitals. So we're not yet in the Mao era of lining people up against the wall and shooting them, but the leaders are being killed and picked off. It's amazing the influence they still have politically. Uh, we just learned uh, two days ago that the leader of China wants to have a... Uh, no term limits. He wants to serve forever until he dies. Uh, the outrage from our press is non-existent. Uh, he had Tim Cook turn over all the uh, encrypted uh, keys to people who live in China. Uh, so you, if you have an iCloud account and they, for whatever reason, without warrant, want to see what you're posting and saving in your iCloud account, uh, they can just do it uh, because they have so much financial influence this is the largest economy uh in the world and when it takes off in you know six to eight years uh it's going to be unprecedented which also leads to the their hyper capitalism uh, capitalism without morals um we have to really see keep an eye on this because uh they're going to have more influence in north korea they'll have more influence in south korea they currently have lots of influence in vietnam and other places uh Another place, Vietnam and Christianity, it's not a place to be a Christian. Well, the, the thing that we also need to keep in mind is that the time is not on the Chinese side. Mm -hmm. And that the one-child policy that the communists introduced under Mao that was there for 20, 30 years means that by about 2040, the we in the United States worry because by 2040, I don't know what the number is, but there may be... 10 working people supporting one retiree. By that time in China, it's almost going to be two to one. In other words, the the burden of an aging demographic population. And so China has to make the moves now for international power, hegemony, and financial success. So it's part of, I believe, it's what's one of the things motivating the Chinese government. They've got to be, they've got to seize the moment. Whereas the United States, we we have time they don't yeah that's true um i want to move on quickly uh we got like two minutes and talk about the death of billy graham uh now i did not have a lot of uh interaction with the billy graham movements growing up i became a christian in the uh, early 80s and uh a lot of his influence was before that as far as traveling around and giving his uh evangelical stadium level uh, preaching um, but I was really surprised by how the left and the right reacted to his death and assumed he was a theologian. And uh, I was a little disappointed with uh, how everybody came out and uh, uh, were kind of mean to uh, the late Billy Graham, George. Uh, am I missing something? I would not say everybody. No, not everybody. Uh, no. The uh, in the Guardian and in the independent British newspapers and the occasional American academic or far left Christian they came out with these nasty things about Billy Graham uh, and in essence Billy Graham was not the sort of Christian they are and therefore he must be bad so that the, the current atmosphere of you're either with me or you're evil or stupid they translated into discussion of Billy Graham and you know who cares? And then we have some on the conservative side of the Christian movement who attacked Billy Graham for not being as pure as they are on a number of issues. And Billy Graham was Billy Graham. He did not have a call to be a systematic theologian. He was not a writer. 
he was a pulpit evangelist who brought touch people emotionally and spiritually and brought them to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And that those people range from the Jensen brothers in Sydney, Australia, mm-hmm. who are very academic, very intellectual. You can't chop logic with them and help to come out a winner. They'll beat you every time to common, uh, ordinary, uneducated hillbillies in here in Florida. Graham touched people in a way that no other American pastor has nationally ever. It's, yeah. But people, people, I think it's jealousy. I think there's the Hitchens effect. You remember when, I think oh, it's geez. Peter Hitchens, yeah, not Peter. Peter. Hitchens, when Mother Teresa died. Sorry, yeah. Christopher Hitchens. That's right. Yeah. Peter's his brother. Christopher Hitchens wrote this nasty uh, obituary of Mother Teresa, and it went viral. Millions of people read it, and I think there's some people who want to emulate Christopher Hitchens by using the death of Billy Graham to be deliberately nasty to get themselves out in front of the public. Certainly, a no-name professor who wrote the obituary in The Guardian, that's what he was doing. I mean, you'll never hear this guy again. Uh, Well, (coughs) excuse me, the coffee's coming up. That's my biggest problem. If you have trouble with Billy Graham, you need to address it while he's living. Um, we have this ability to, when somebody dies, uh, lay waste. And, you know, that's ridiculous. Um, he was not the theologian. He was an evangelist, evangelical, and he brought the simplest message of Christ to the world. He visited a, a hundred and, I don't know, 90-some countries, 85 countries. Good luck doing that, you know. That's just... It, it's an amazing life he led and i think the biggest complaint uh people have in their jealousy is uh at no point did any part of his ministry or himself fall you know we we saw all the televangelists from the the 70s and 80s they're all gone they all fell um billy graham and his ministry uh was above the pale because they kept some good rules that really helped billy graham always kept the focus on jesus Mm -hmm. So whatever political issue was out there at the time that people say, you must be on this side or that side, whether it's global warming or the Vietnam War, or whatever it is, Billy Graham wasn't there because he was putting the focus on Jesus Christ. And that's what lasts, not the passing political fancies of the moment. George, have yourself a good weekend. Uh, we had a good show, I think, 20 minutes. That's not bad. We want to thank you for being patient during Lent for our show. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Julius and George. And we are watching episode 375 of Anglican Unscripted.